Mary Minus Biddy, former Florida slave, as reported to interviewer for the Federal Writers Project between 1936 and 1938. Mary Minus Biddy, age 105, was born in Pensacola, Florida, 1833, and raised in Columbia County. She is married and has several children. For her age, she is exceptionally active, being able to wash and do her housework. With optimism, she looks forward to many more years of life. Her health is excellent. Having spent 32 years of her life as a slave, she relates vividly some of her experiences. Her master, Lancaster Jameson, was a very kind man and never mistreated his slaves. He was a man of mediocre means, and instead of having a large plantation, as was usual in those days, he ran a boarding house. The revenue therefrom furnishing him sustenance for a livelihood. He had a small farm from which fresh produce was obtained to supply the needs of the lodges. Mary's family were his only slaves. The family consisted of her mother, father, brother, and sister. The children called the old master Fa and their father Pipe. The master never resented this appellation and took it in good humor. Many travelers stopped at his boarding house. Mary's mother did the cooking, her father tended the farm, and Mary, her brother and sister, did chores about the place. There was a large one-room house built in the yard in which the family lived. Her father had a separate garden in which he raised his own produce, also a smokehouse where the family meats were kept. Meats were smoked in order to preserve them. During the day, Mary's father was kept so busy attending the master's farm, there was no time to attend to a little farm that he was allowed to have. He overcame this handicapped power by setting up a huge scaffold in the field where he burned and from the flames that this fire emitted, he could see well enough to do what was necessary to his farm. Mary was very active with the plow. She could handle it with the agility of a man. This prowess gained her the title of plow girl. Cooking. Stoves were unknown, and cooking was done in a fireplace that was built of clay. A large iron rod was built in across the opening of the fireplace on which hung pots that had special handles that fitted about the rod holding them in place over the blazing fire as the food cooking was done in a movable oven which was placed in the fireplace over hot coals or corn cobs. Potatoes were roasted in ashes. Off time, Mary's father would sit in the front of the fireplace until a late hour into the night, and on arising in the morning, the children would find in a corner a number of roasted potatoes which their father had thoughtfully roasted and which the children readily consumed. Lighting system. Matches were unknown. A flint rock and a file provided the fire. This occurred by striking a file against a flint rock, which threw off sparks that flew into a wad of dry cotton used for the purpose. The cotton, as a rule, readily caught fire. This was fire and all the fire needed to start any blaze. Weaving. The white folk wove the cloth on regular looms, which were made into dresses for slaves. For various colors of cloth, the thread was dyed. The dye was made by digging up red shank and wild indigo roots, which were boiled, the substance obtained being some of the best dye to be found. Beverages and food. Bread was made from flour and wheat. The meat used was pork, beef, mutton, and goat. For preservation, it was smoked and kept in the smokehouse. 
Coffee was used as a beverage, and when that ran out, as oft times happened, parched peanuts were used for the purpose. Mary and family rose before daybreak and prepared breakfast for the master and his family, after which they ate in the same dining room. When this was over, the dishes were washed by Mary, her brother and sister. The children then played about until meals were served again. Washing and Soap Washing was done in homemade wooden tubs and boiling in an iron pot, similar to those used today. Soap was made from fat and lye. Amusements. The only amusement to be had was a big candy pulling or hog killing and chicken cooking. The slaves from the surrounding plantations were allowed to come together on these occasions. A big time was had. Church. The slaves went to the white folks' church on Sundays. They were seated in the rear of the church. The white minister would arise and exhort the slaves to mind your masters, you owe them your respect. An old Christian slave who perceived things differently could sometimes be heard to muddle. Yeah, we's just as good as day is, only day's white, and we's black, huh? She dare not let the whites hear this. At times, meetings were held in the slave cabin, where some inspired slave-led services. The greatest event in the life of a slave was about to occur. The most sorrowful in the life of a master. Freedom was at hand. A negro was seen coming in the distance, mounted, on a mule approaching Mr. Jameson, who stood upon the porch, he told him of the liberation of the slaves. Mr. Jameson had never before been heard to curse, but this was the one day that he let go a torrent of words that are unworthy to appear in print. He then broke down and cried like a slave who was being bashed by his cruel master, he called Mary's mother and father, Phyllis and Sandy, and said, I ain't got no more to do with you. You are free. If you want to stay with me, you may, and I'll give you one third of what you mine. They decided to stay. When the crop was harvested, the master did not do as he promised. He gave them nothing. Mary slipped away, mounted the mule Mustang, and galloped away at the mule snail speed to Newbanville, where she related what happened to the Union captain. He gave her a letter to give Mr. Jameson. In it, he reminded them if he didn't give Mary's family what he had promised, he would be put in jail. Without hesitation, the old master complied with these pungent orders. After this incident, Mary and her family left the good old boss to seek a new abode in other parts. This was the first time the master had in any way displayed any kind of unfairness toward them. Perhaps it was a reaction to having to liberate them. Marriage there was no marriage during slavery according to civil or religious custom among the slaves. If a slave saw a woman whom he desired, he told his master. If the woman in question belonged to another plantation, the master would consult her master, saying, one of my boys wants to marry one of your gals. As a rule, it was agreeable that they should live together as man and wife. This was encouraged, for it increased the slave population by newborns, hence being an asset to the masters. The two slaves thus joined, uh, while allowed to see each other at intervals upon special permission from the master. He must have a pass to leave the plantation. Any slave caught without one while off the plantation was subject to be caught by the putter rollers who was a low class of white who roved the country to molest a slave at the least opportunity, 
Some of them were hired by the masters to guard against slaves running away and to apprehend them in the event that they did. They would beat a slave unmercifully and send them back to the plantation from whence they came. As a result of this form of matrimony at emancipation, there were no slaves lawfully married. Orders were given that if they preferred to live together as man and wife, they must marry according to law. They were given nine months to decide this question, after which, if they continued to live together, they were arrested for adultery. And Mr. Pryor, Justice of the Peace in Gainesville, was assigned to deal with the situation around the plantation where Mary and her family lived. A big supper was given. It was early. About 25 slave couples attended. There was gaiety and laughter. A barrel of lemonade was served. A big time was had by all. Then those couples who desired to remain together were joined in wedlock. The party broke up in the early hours of the morning. Mary now passed the century mark, her lean bronze body resting in a rocker, her head wrapped in a white kerchief and puffing slowly on her clay pipe, expressed herself in regard to the presidents. Said, Roosevelt has done more than any other president. Why, you know, ever since freedom, they've been talking about this pension, talking about it, that's all. But you see, Mr. Roosevelt, he done come and given it to us. What? I'll say he's a good, righteous man. And I'm sure going to vote for it. Residing in her little cabin in Eatonville, Florida, she is able to smile because she has some means of security, the old age pension.